So Stephen and I put together a few, identified a few themes, general themes for discussion and prioritization, one around translation, the other one around genetic architecture, and nested in both is study design and the depth of the various phenotyping in the various projects, but there's really an issue of the next session. But for translation, the discussion uh, centered around using uh, translational paradigms, discoveries for either advocacy, adverse reaction studies, or risk resilience outcomes. Um, some of these studies could also be um, used uh, using modifiers. Some of the translational um, studies could be used with modifiers, for maybe perhaps Mendelian, some of the Mendelian disorders, and uh, Mike's beautiful talk on, on CF, ol oligogenic diseases, or even complex diseases like autism or others. Uh, again, uh, it will depend on the study design, which one of these uh, translational uh, hypotheses we could pursue. The genetic architecture theme, oh, the architecture theme <coughs> centered around discussion of uh, rare variation. Clearly we need uh, large sample sizes. I think there was consensus. And we also talked about the, the need to develop um, that the, the mathematical framework of these uh, tests for variation is still underdeveloped. And we also uh, touched on um, higher order, what we call the higher order models. We think about, again, modifiers, uh, epistasis, and other higher dimensional data that could be integrated uh, into, to the point of your systems biology perspective, like we heard from Judy. And then lastly, and uh, following that great discussion we just had on, ph on phenotypes, how important are phenotypes, our study designs where we do broad, in-depth phenotyping, uh, and so on. And with that, I want to open it up for discussion. What did we miss? Yeah, what did we miss? <laughs> the, it's burning. There were a number of comments. I don't think there's enough about drug-party discoveries driving quite a bit of the seeming lost in this last okay. time. It's not yeah. a criticism, it's just no. observation. So in terms of spectrum of phenotypes with a given mutation, um, so we're, we're trying to get at questions that we want to address by, by sequencing. So, so that isn't a sequencing question, it's a phenotyping question. And yet you have to do the sequencing to find the people that have the variant to then go in and phenotype them. So is that kind of covered in what you've shown? Well, I, I think that's going to be this afternoon and it's been referred to last night and today is with this question of revisitation or, you know, recontact with the subjects. And I think it maps also back to what Maynard was saying about, you know, being able to sequence as large as possible and finding people who are under those thresholds of current clinical diagnostic categories of saying they have IBD or whatever. And as you sort of look from the genetics and try and work backwards to what you think they're interesting phenotypes that are lining up. It's almost like reverse GWAS, so to speak, is, is what I'm, I'm, I'm hearing where you, the genetics are going to drive how you would group your, your, your phenotypes and what may need to be done to refine that. Yeah, you know, th there was an entertaining discussion that went on for about 10 years about what was forward genetics and what was reverse genetics. <laughs> this is the true reverse genetics. You know, genetics traditionally went from phenotype to genotype, but I think this discovery by genotype is going to be very important. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd just make one more point on this issue of phenotypic heterogeneity uh, and quality of phenotyping and so forth. Uh, uh, I think there are two issues here, uh, probably more, but there are two really obvious ones. Uh, one has to do with whether the phenotyping was simply done in the sort of the best possible way. So I, I don't know anything about measuring heart rates, but I'm willing to uh, I'm willing to assume that there's some better way of doing it than just sort of trying to count your pulse. Uh, and so there, of course, we would like you know the phenotype that we're working with to have been at least measured in the best possible way. Uh, uh, the, usually when there's the, these discussions about phenotypic quality, don't so much have to do with that. Uh, they just, they, they really have to do with just sort of how precise and uniform uh, the criteria were for establishing very complex phenotypes. Now, 
uh, Tom might want to comment on this because he's a veteran of the sort of mental health wars. But uh, my, my, as an outsider observing that, that it's an interesting example. Uh, there was a 1980s phase of, uh, of uh, false positive linkages to this and that uh, psychiatric phenotype and a lot of hand wring wringing about that. And, uh, and it, it tended to lead to a long period in which uh, uh, the idea was that we'd find the genetic causation of these diseases if we used really strict, uniform, cross-center kinds of criteria for uh, traits, the exceedingly complex traits that we don't actually really know how to phenotype. Uh, I always thought that was mistaken, uh, well-intended as it was, uh, according to a very simple argument, and that is that if you look in the literature, and I, I believe this comment applies rather broadly to many, many human phenotypes, but if you looked in the literature about psychiatric phenotypes and said, okay, I want to find uh, the patients uh, where I have the strongest belief that I'm looking at genetic causation, what you would, of course, do is find these very rare families, but some of them have been published on repeatedly over decades, uh, in which in multi-generations, you know, you just look at it and it looks sort of autosomal dominant uh, for psychiatric disease. But the phenotypes in those families are all over the map. You've got schizophrenia, you have paranoia, you have bipolar. This is not because they were evaluated by different uh, psychiatrists. It's uh, because their phenotypes are all over the map. They're being modulated by a lot of genetic and environmental factors that just lead to all sorts of different phenotypes, even though there probably is, underlying all of that, uh, segregation of, of some, some mutation that is perhaps best thought of as one that is affecting the sort of homeostasis of sort of normal behavioral brain function. And I, I think there's probably lots of that. Uh, it, we just tend not to capture it. And so it's, it's a more biological way of, of looking, at, uh, looking at this issue. Yes, we would like to measure the phenotypes you know, with the best kind of thermometer and, and so forth, but, uh, but I, you know, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, that we, we want these cohorts to have been uh, minimally pre-selected uh, to meet you know, a whole bunch of criteria. Okay. Could, could I ask one question? Uh, if I'm understanding correctly, maybe I'm confused, you're suggesting that we'll do genome sequencing, we'll find variants, and it will be associated with the disease, recognized disease in some people, and it will not, it'll be not associated with recognized disease in other people. So we're going to bring those people back in and phenotype them to see if we can pull out some phenotype that's not been recognized. But isn't it just as likely or more likely that there are underlying genetic variation in those people that don't have a recognized phenotype uh, that's, that's modifying the situation? And so before you bring the people back in and phenotype them, how are you going to look at your genetic data to figure out if, <laughs> if it's they don't have a clinical phenotype that's been recognized because they don't have a clinical phenotype because they've got other modifying genetic or environmental influences. I mean, that is the sixty-four thousand dollar question. I mean, it you know it takes us from the, you know the single you know what used to be single gene and now we're down to single variant testing, and then the question is what's that context? You know, CF was a monogenic disorder, but and everyone forgot about the 24,999 other genes, and now as we have the tools, we can see that that has an important influence. I think we're going to have to think those, the, those same things through, and I wonder whether there'll be sort of a dialectic between how good the assessment of some of the phenotypes are and you know the capacity to be able to look at ancillary or related things and and the genetics just not of that variant or that gene but what the context is i mean because in the end we probably all have our own genetic carburetors set at slightly different levels but we have no idea how to quantify or to describe that we just sort of i think generically think that we have you know, everybody has a carburetor but the question is what's it set at for me or for you uh, and it's going to take very, very large numbers to do that. And, and that could very well be the most important thing that comes out of 
sequencing very large numbers just to see the relationships uh, between these variants and, and what they may or may not mean in very broad strokes. I, I wonder if it could work like this, because we've said bring people back, but sometimes you don't need to. So if Judy's work in an exquisitely well-characterized population says, oh, interesting, not just for CF, but I find something which you know, has, which leads to COPD in that population, and now let's say it wasn't known, I want to just bring it back to this central, cheaper, broader, available, large resource and quickly look to see anybody else that we've already sequenced who has anything remotely like it or otherwise genotyped. Then I, I don't want to bring them back in. I just want to look, for example, at their at whether or not they ever were hospitalized for COPD, which we can do now. That doesn't cost anything. That's just, that's just linkage. Nobody's been brought back in, or if it's in CRUK, maybe they were looked or not. Maybe they're in a, it depends on which sitting you're in, but you do a quick look, and yes or no, there's a signal to this more common other phenotype, and if you like what you see, it's anything. It's not perfect. Then step three, is you go do the detailed, appropriate study there. You can't ask this broad, smart, quick check place either to be as clever at discovering what Judy found, nor could you ask it to be ready-made to answer the question on some link to the other disease. So I, I feel that this kind of three-step bounce, or three, three different places to go, might be closer to answering the question we're we're, we're trying, the design question we're getting at here, we want something that can fulfill that middle function really well to save us a lot of time chasing false leads. We'll miss a few things. But it should be at least the place to go for her to come and say, I know it's true for CF people, let me look at some others. If I get any kind of hint, then I'll spend the money and do the more elaborate study. But you don't have to always bring people back in. Sometimes you can see what did they die from and with what were they hospitalized? No point. And on that note, um, you can also get a lot of phenotype data just by asking people. So simply by having a recontact mechanism where you can simply ask questions of someone will, could potentially be very powerful for certain, for certain phenotypes. Would do that, would at most ask by questionnaire. I mean, you take nurses or something, it would be the next mailing. It would be unlikely that they would bring them back in and you know, draw blood and do a whole series of things. So just uh, getting back to the therapeutic development question and, and Judy's talk, I was, I was really intrigued by the TNF story and the, and the fact that there is, uh, although this is biologically a very compelling, you know, a very clearly established pathway in, in this disease, there's no genetic evidence to, to support, well, weak genetic evidence to support, support its role. And I was wondering what, what you thought was the explanation for that and whether it teaches us anything about the challenges for using genetic information to find therapeutic targets. Um, so I, I wouldn't say it's um, no evidence because uh, literally one of the major downstream pathways of TNF is NF-kappa-B activation. So we have a number of NF-kappa-B genes that are associated. The other kind of point that I rushed through was that uh, on our GO analysis, again, we haven't proven that these are actually the causal genes, but in our GO analysis of the genes within our loci, we see a large number of ubiquitinating and deubiquitinating genes. And so a lot of how TNF works, as well as immune-mediated diseases in general, is you have transient effects in innate immune cells. And so you have this rapid increase and decrease of RNA uh, expression. And so one of the most important pan immune mediated disease genes is A20 or TNF-AIP3, which is one of, like TNF has all these A-rich elements and goes up and down. So the fact that we have 15 ubiquitinating and potentially 15, we haven't proven them, but uh, ubiquitinating and deubiquitinating genes, uh, that's a lot of how TNF acts. Mm -hmm. And so the answer is it's just much more complex. The IL-23 pathway is so simple and straightforward. TNF is almost by itself too important. Mm -hmm. I think, I mean, to think that, one, that blocking one cytokine would work in a disease, um, I would never have thought it was going to work. Sure. And it, the fact that it does is so remarkable. Um, and so uh, I think a lot of the other mechanisms that are being utilized now for a drug discovery uh, involve much broader suppression of cytokines than just blocking one cytokine. So the fact that blocking one cytokine can treat diseases 
I would say remarkable. So it's it's but, complex is the bottom line. But, but it certainly emphasizes the fact that uh, a lot of the genetic evidence for drug targets may well be indirect. So we we may need to take the preponderance of genetic evidence and use that to point back towards some therapeutic target. That makes sense. Yes. Hmm. Um, again, the the flip side of the of studying the cytokine story is that you know the the clearest case of Mendelian IBD is IL-10 deficiency. Uh, the knockout mice gets IBD, uh, autosomal recessives, and the cytokine, the receptor, and yet IL-10 has not been effective in the treatment of IBD, which is a little bit uh, sobering. Uh, it's pop there are technical reasons why it may not have worked. It may be that the local drug levels weren't high enough. There's all kinds of reasons. Um, but I think the consensus feeling is that you're outside of TNF probably going to have to target multiple cytokines. So, so is there is there precedent for for using the kind of data that you've presented to tailor uh, multi-drug regimens for patients yet? Again, uh, it, it's, I, I think, uh, there's no question that the major IBD trials have established that multimodality therapy, so 6MP plus anti-TNF is more effective than either drug alone. So clearly, um, I think that we are looking at a scenario where you're going to have to target multiple pathways. And that's just, in terms of the combinatorial complexity that that ensues, um, it's going to be enormous. And so um, it's, it's not clear that it's going to be a simple targeting pathway like in cancer. And, and do you think it's going to be a, a set of targets for all patients with IBD or a set of personalized targets for each patient with IBD? So a raging debate in the IBD field is, you know, so TNFs, I don't know, they were introduced quite a while, anti-TNFs were introduced a long time ago, and we still don't agree. If you ask 10 clinicians, you'll come up with 10 different answers as to are all, are all IBD patients responsive to anti-TNF? Um, and kind of the traditional measures that we use in the phase three trials are very gross measures of well-being and stool frequency, and it's not getting that specific. And so we still, you know, I, I think that's a terribly important question, is, is every IBD patient a, quote, TNF responder? And we don't even have the answer to that. So I, I'm not terribly optimistic that we're going to be able to use genetics to subset folks. You're going to have to have a, a huge intermediate phenotyping component. Um, so just a just a quick comment uh, based on on Trisha's um, suggestion in terms of of could we have a cohort or a or study that is the next place to go after you find your your variant and and that's that's very attractive in terms of the thousand genomes model where you know people next went to the sequence data but the sequence data could be represented basically uniformly across the sequence I, I suspect that disease and phenotype and exposure and medication data and electronic medical record data and that can't be represented quite so easily and readily for for very so maybe what we, we would need is someone for them to consult, to, to interact with, and you know, look at your you know, million man or million person cohort and, and tell me if there's anything related to this, rather than having it be more of a passive kind of just, just go in and, and you know, scan. So it's something to think about, at least. I don't know, Trisha, if you have any thoughts on that. All right. We should think about that while we eat lunch. So we've... Yeah, well, we get lunch, and then we'll eat it. And we've come to the end of a, 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 a very productive and I think a very insightful uh, session this morning. We want to thank the speakers once again and all the discussants for bringing you know, a number of very important issues to the table and some really quite remarkable and exciting s stories. It's, it, it's just really quite, quite astounding. So now what we're supposed to do is go into the next room and pick up our lunch and come back so that by 11.30, Daniel will be at the podium ready to speak. Well, sorry, to, proverbially he'll be at the podium, but he, he will have munched his way, so he should be able to go first to eat if that's what he wants. So, Daniel, you get to cut the line if you want. <laughs> I think you should let this up for a minute to tell people to go get their stuff.